The room is dark and quiet, a Faraday cage muffling the outside world. A volunteer sits in a recliner, blindfolded with a modified snowmobile helmet snug against their head. Eight small electromagnetic coils are arranged across the helmet surface, positioned carefully over his temporal lobes. Somewhere behind the wall, there's a technician. He activates what the lab calls a complex magnetic signal. This is a pattern designed to gently stimulate deep structures of the brain. For some volunteers, the next 50 minutes bring something unexpected. A powerful sense of presence emerges, as if someone or something is standing just off of their shoulder. Some describe it as a guardian. Others feel an ancestor, an angel, or simply an undeniable other. Some volunteers, though, they feel nothing beyond boredom and a stiff neck by the time the session ends. So, this apparatus, it began life as the Corrin Helmet, named after Stanley Corrin, the engineer who built it. It was designed to test the ideas of neuroscientist Michael Persinger about how temporal lobe activity might give rise to mystical states. The magnetic fields it generates, they were remarkably weak, just one or two microteslas, orders of magnitude weaker than the powerful pulses used in clinical transcranial magnetic stimulation. These weren't Bruce Fort signals, they were patterned, subtle, and according to Persinger's hypothesis, well, that patterning was the key. Now, to understand why anyone would want to build such a device, we need to go back to 1983. That's when Michael Persinger published a provocative paper proposing that religious and mystical experiences might arise from specific patterns of activity in the temporal lobes. He suggested that these experiences weren't necessarily supernatural events, but rather artifacts of how our brains process information. Sometimes, he theorized, environmental electromagnetic fields could nudge the temporal lobes in ways that trigger these profound subjective states. The helmet was Persinger's attempt to test this hypothesis under controlled laboratory conditions. Stanley Corrin engineered the coil system to deliver what they called complex magnetic signals directly to the temporal regions. Meanwhile, the lab carefully controlled every other variable, light, sound, and crucially, the expectations of the volunteers. If the theory was right, they could reliably produce mystical experiences simply by applying the correct electromagnetic patterns. All right, so how is this whole thing gonna work? Well, Persinger's model proposed that the magnetic fields could gently disrupt communication between the brain's two hemispheres. And when that happens, the usually subordinate sense of self in one hemisphere might intrude into conscious awareness, but because it's coming from the wrong place in the brain, it gets interpreted as an external presence, as that other that we mentioned earlier. Now, the fields involved are genuinely tiny, like we said, one or two micro Tesla. These are basically weaker than a refrigerator magnet. For reference, Earth's natural magnetic field hovers around 50 micro Tesla, but according to Persinger, raw strength wasn't the point here. The fields were patterned in time, and that patterning, he believed, was what really mattered. Word of Persinger's work spread quickly, and soon journalists and public figures were streaming to Sunbury, Ontario, eager to try the helmet for themselves. The results were all over the map. Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist and prominent atheist, reported feeling only slightly dizzy and relaxed after his session. Nothing divine, nothing transcendent, just a bit of a nice nap in a dark room. But psychologist Susan Blackmore had a strikingly different experience. She reported powerful, unusual sensations that left a lasting impression. These anecdotes cut both ways, and that's important to remember. Anecdotes, they're not data. They're stories. They're subjective reports from individuals with different expectations, different personalities, and different neurological makeups. But these mixed reports help explain the helmet's mythic status. Some people felt God, some people felt nothing. The question became, well, why? And the turning point came in 2005. A Swedish research team, led by Per Granquist at Uppsala University, decided to put the God Helmet to a rigorous test. They ran a double-blind replication study with 89 participants, carefully controlling for the factors that might influence results. This time, neither the participants nor the experimenters running the sessions knew whether the magnetic field was actually turned on. And the results were striking, but not in the way Persinger's supporters might have hoped. The experiences people reported correlated strongly with personality traits like suggestibility and absorption, the tendency to become deeply immersed in mental imagery. But those experiences didn't correlate with whether the magnetic field was actually on or off. The helmet seemed to work as a placebo, not as a brain stimulation device. Persinger and Corrin published a rebuttal arguing that the Swedish team hadn't replicated their exact protocols. 
The Swedish researchers stood by their methods and published a reply. The scientific community was left with a dispute, and well, this is where the simple narrative that the god helmet makes you see God starts to wobble. Maybe the helmet wasn't doing what everyone thought it was doing. The placebo explanation got even stronger support from an ingenious field study conducted at a Dutch music festival. Researchers from the University of Amsterdam set up a tent and invited festival goers to try what they called a god helmet. About 193 people volunteered, but here's the thing. The helmet was completely fake. It was just a skating helmet with inert wires attached. No magnetic fields, no brain stimulation, nothing at all. You were just wearing a regular ass helmet. The researchers told participants that the device could induce mystical states and measured what people experienced. Many participants reported extraordinary experiences, especially those who scored high on measures of spirituality. Some felt profound sensations, unusual perceptions, and meaningful encounters, all from a skating helmet with fake wires. The study was pre-registered, that means the researchers publicly committed to their methods before collecting data, which makes the results even harder to dismiss. Expectation turned out bit of a big deal with this thing. Okay, but the questions raised by the God Helmet inspired other researchers to investigate whether electromagnetic fields and other environmental factors could really produce supernatural seeming experiences. One ambitious project called the Haunt Project set out to engineer a haunted room. The team used both infrasounds, those low-frequency sound waves below the range of human hearing, and complex electromagnetic fields, the same kind of signals Persinger used. Volunteers entered the specially designed space and reported on what they experienced. Some people did report unusual sensations, strange feelings, and eerie presences. But when the researchers analyzed the data, they found something revealing. The unusual experiences were completely unrelated to whether the electromagnetic field or infrasound were actually turned on. Suggestion, in context, appeared to be driving the reports. In other words, if you tell people a room is spooky and set the right atmosphere, some of them are gonna feel spooked whether or not you're secretly running any equipment behind the walls. All right, so while the God Helmet story was playing out, other researchers were making real progress in understanding how the brain generates feelings of presence. And they were using rather different methods. In 2006, a team of clinicians reported a striking case. They were using electrical stimulation to map a patient's brain before surgery, and when they stimulated a specific region called the temporoparietal junction, the patient reported seeing a shadow person behind her. The experience was reliable and repeatable, appearing every time that particular spot was stimulated. Then in 2014, researchers at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology took things even further. They built a robot system that could create sensor remoter conflicts in situations where your movement and the sensory feedback you receive don't quite match up. When volunteers used the system and experienced a slight delay between their movements and the feedback, many of them reported a powerful sense that someone else was in the room with them. Some found the experience so disturbing that they asked to stop the experiment. These methods reliably induce presence experiences in controlled settings, and they don't require weak magnetic fields. They work through direct electrical stimulation or by manipulating the brain's predictions about sensory feedback. The mechanisms are understood, the effects are replicable, and the science has moved forward. It's worth noting that Persinger's interest in weak magnetic fields went beyond just the helmet. His research group reported correlations between natural geomagnetic activity, the fluctuations in Earth's magnetic field caused by solar activity, and reports of sensed presences in certain individuals. The idea was that people who were particularly susceptible might be influenced by these natural variations in the magnetic environment. These correlational findings are debated in the scientific community. Correlation doesn't establish causation, and the effects, if real, are subtle and hard to pin down. This work helps explain why Persinger remained convinced that weak electromagnetic fields could influence consciousness. He wasn't just thinking about a helmet in a lab, he was thinking about a much broader picture of how human brains might interact with the electromagnetic environment around us. The God Helmet's fame also spawned commercial spin-offs. Because of course it did money. One of the most prominent is called the Eight Coil Shakti, marketed as a device that can produce spiritual experiences or improve mood through the same kind of weak magnetic field stimulation that Persinger studied. The device comes with testimonials and claims of profound effects, because of course it does. But when independent researchers tested a similar device in a randomized placebo-controlled study, the results were underwhelming. The study involved 37 participants, and the researchers found no significant differences in emotional responses between people who received real stimulation and those who received sham stimulation. The proponents of these devices counter with their own EEG-based research papers and collections of user testimonials. 
the debate continues, but there's a notable absence of high-quality independent replications showing clear effects. The question remains contested and unsolved. So look, before we go any further today, we need to address something really important. The magnetic fields used in the God Helmet are tiny compared to clinical TMS devices and even those ordinary refrigerator magnets. That may make them sound harmless, but building or using DIY brain stimulation devices carries real risks. There are electrical hazards if you don't know what you're doing. There are psychological risks, especially for people with certain vulnerabilities that wouldn't be screened for outside a clinical setting. But there's a bigger ethical issue at play here, one that goes beyond physical safety. It's what we might call expectation engineering. As we've seen throughout today's story, suggestion and context can produce powerful subjective experiences on their own, creating situations where people expect to have mystical or unusual experiences, especially when you're claiming it's due to some technological intervention, raises serious questions about informed consent and psychological manipulation. We want to be very, very clear. We strongly discourage any attempts to replicate brain stimulation devices outside of regulated research environments. <laughs> Pretty obvious stuff, isn't it? The risks aren't worth it, and the evidence suggests you'll be building an elaborate placebo device anyway. All right, so let's step back now and ask what survives when we strip away the hype and look at what the evidence actually tells us. Two pillars remain standing. First, context and suggestion can evoke genuinely profound experiences. The festival study and the haunted room experiments make this very clear. When people expect something extraordinary, when the setting supports that expectation, and when their personality traits align with suggestibility and absorption, they can have powerful experiences that feel completely real. Second, the brain does have known roots to generating feelings of presence. We understand now that these experiences can arise from sensor and motor prediction errors. These are disruptions in how the brain monitors and predicts its own actions. We know the temporal parietal junction plays a key role. and These mechanisms are real, they're replicable, and they don't depend on belief or suggestion. What hasn't survived is the specific claim at the heart of the God Helmet story that weak patterns magnetic fields can reliably induce godlike presences beyond what suggestion and personality traits can explain. Under stricter experimental controls with proper blinding and larger sample sizes, that effect disappears. The helmet may have worked, but it seems to have worked as a very elaborate theatrical prop, not as a precise tool for manipulating neural activity. Thank you for watching.